fact, I just exchanged email with a, a guy that was a senior VP at Qualcomm who works in product development. And he's been retired for a while, but he understands the wireless business and how to productize a product, which we're, we're trying to do. So, I mm -hmm. mean, leveraging his knowledge, his expertise is going to be valuable. And uh, I need to, but before he, before he loses all his contacts, because he retired, I think, uh, three or four years ago, you know, it'd be good to, to leverage his contacts, his knowledge, and, and see what we can do to proliferate our product mm -hmm. to the folks he knows. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, um, no, that's, that's great. Well, hey, well, let's get started. Since we're at 503, I will bring up my, um, my slides here. And let's see, I got that up here. And I'm gonna do this, share my screen. Da, 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 da. Oh, pressing the wrong one. Oh, okay, okay. I'm pressing the wrong button. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, and then I'm going to just let me switch from these. Okay. All right. So, well, good evening, everyone. I'm excited to uh, be with you this evening for our October edition of our Founders First Fast Path Fireside Chat. My name is Kim Folsom. I'm your host and the founder and CEO of Founders First Capital Partners, as well as the founder of Founders First CDC. Um, for some of you, this may be your first time joining this session, uh, one of our sessions. So Founders First is a small business growth accelerator, as well as a direct investor in uh, funding and growing businesses led by diverse founders. Uh, we are bought by, uh, to you this evening by a whole host of really great partners. Uh, without them, this would not be possible. Our uh, great uh, host partner has been National University System. And then our additional program partners have been the Small Business Development Center, as well as um, our Founders First Capital Partners. And then we've got some supporting bank partners that support our programs. And they are the um, US Bank, as well as Pacific Western Bank, Union Bank, and Wells Fargo. Tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Mr. Art Salandong, who has made such a significant uh, impact in the uh, defense area. And I have had the pleasure of knowing him for a very, 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 very long time. I won't, I won't just to uh, 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 protect both of our ages, I won't say how many decades long, but it's so exciting to share his um, success. And Art is uh, the managing director of um, uh, 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 Trubus and Tri Trebus Technologies. And, uh, and prior to that, he was the uh, director of, um, a, a director of program management at Qualcomm. And then prior to that, he was a um, military officer with the US Navy, spe specifically a program manager, a submarine officer. And so um, we're gonna hear in detail a bit about Art's background but in our conversation today, we're gonna to organize our discussion around three areas. One is key strategies for leveraging the military defense background to grow an innovative uh, technology business. Secondarily, we're gonna talk a little bit about transitioning uh, and scaling a service-based business to a product and tech-enabled service businesses. And then the other is would like to have your perspective as far as funding a type of business like you have given, you know, our area of interest and our listeners who focus on, um, who are diverse founders uh, getting started. But before we jump into this, um, Art, why don't you tell us a little, begin and share a little with our audience a bit about your background and your entrepreneurial journey as a top Naval Academy graduate to becoming managing director of Trebus. Um, okay, yes. Uh... Um, I, actually, I um, I grew up here in San Diego. I'm a graduate of Mira Mesa High School. Uh, 
I got an appointment to the Naval Academy and, and Naval Academy is one of the military academies where after you graduate, you uh, serve in the Navy. Uh, my undergraduate was in uh, mathematics uh, with an emphasis in operations research or operations analysis. And uh, immediately after graduation, uh, I was accepted into the Navy nuclear power program. So I served on uh, nuclear submarines. I went through the nuclear pipeline training program and uh, subsequently served on submarines for two tours. Uh, after my second tour, I got interest in uh, engineering and went back to grad school. And uh, the Navy has a graduate school called the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And I was able to go back and I was a dual master's in physics and engineering acoustics, which is uh, in essence, uh, electrical engineering. And I, I got dual masters and became a engineering manager, program manager, where I was responsible for buying systems for the Navy. And as a program manager, I worked in uh, systems such as undersea surveillance, uh, submarine satellite communications, and cybersecurity systems. So my, my last position in the Navy was as a program manager for Navy cybersecurity. And uh, during the, the last couple of years of my service in the military, I got a third master's degree in product development with an emphasis in information technology. So. Uh, the Navy was very good to me in, the, in all the degrees that it provided. I uh, retired um, after 20 years uh, at the rank of commander, and uh, I went to work at Qualcomm, which, as you know, is a wireless leader, a global wireless leader, and certainly a leader here in San Diego. And going to Qualcomm at that time was a, a very good opportunity as Qualcomm was on a trajectory, uh, growing and really providing wireless services uh, all around the world. Uh, they have thousands or tens of thousands of patents and they were developing new technologies that have benefited uh, all the carriers, uh, all the nations. And I went to work there in the, the government technologies group and had an opportunity to work with some of the best and the brightest. So I, I spent about six years at Qualcomm. And uh, at that point, I kind of had that desire to do my own thing. And that's when I, I left Qualcomm and started uh, Travis Technologies. So at that point I had worked in the government as a program manager awarding contracts. I had worked at Qualcomm as a program manager winning contracts. I kind of knew both sides. And uh, as a business owner, kind of positioned myself where I could start bidding for work and could leverage the the relationships and the contacts I had when I was active duty to start winning some work immediately. Uh, Qualcomm also put me in a position because they were, they, they had paid well and they had stock options and they provided a, a lot in compensation where I didn't have to take a loan. I was able to stay at Qualcomm part-time as I built my business and I was able to leverage the relationships and the contacts I had in the military to get work immediately. So it wasn't very long before I was already uh, growing my business while I was working part-time at Qualcomm. And then uh, within a year, I was able to win additional work and make additional hires and grow the business. Uh, we started off doing a lot of consulting work, uh, technology consulting work uh, in program management, acquisition management in the area of cybersecurity, in the area of systems engineering, uh, networks, IT, uh, and uh, a lot of the command control communications. So we did that for several years, continued to grow very methodically. And, and then I started to get interested in more of the product development. I started to, I, remain, I, I remained in touch with a lot of my, my colleagues at Qualcomm that had developed solutions and systems and uh, as a, uh, they were leaving Qualcomm, I was able to bring some of the, some of the bright uh, scientists and engineers on the trade list, and we were able to start developing some of our own solutions and products on our own. And now we are, we are developing technology solutions for the government. We have uh, developed uh, technologies that have been patented. We are providing, uh, we have three uh, technology portfolios in the area of wireless, uh, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. And we're developing solutions in, in all three, uh, two of which we have uh, submitted or 
gotten approved patented technology. So we've continued to grow. We've been on the uh, Inc. 5000 in the last six years, and uh, I have uh, invested a lot of research and development funds into our uh, innovations. And we are now looking at the steps or the, the processes to commercialize or productize some of the things that we have uh, and being able to serve a larger target market. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, again, we've, we're solvent. We have grown every year. We actually uh, uh, own the real estate that we work in. And uh, we're looking to continue to have impact through our, our innovation. That's fantastic. Um, well, great. Well, this is a, a great backdrop. I'm going to share a little bit about the impact of veteran-based businesses. 9% um, of businesses of the 30 million businesses are owned by veterans. That's a two and a half million businesses and veteran actually employ almost 6 million uh, uh, employees. And if you look at the different kind of breakouts of areas of expertise, uh, you fall in one of the top six categories between you know, finance and insurance, transportation, mining, quarry, uh, construction, but also technology services are related to manufacturing. And then the other thing that we always share with folks is kind of the getting started and, and expansion capital um, that you know, many companies are using their own, many founders, uh, veteran-led businesses will use their own capital almost 62% when they're getting started. So that sounds like with you, you get, were able to use your own capital, personal capital to get started and then growth capital, some 30% use um, their own uh, you know, uh, uh, resources to grow as opposed to going outside. Um, but uh, with that, I would like to uh, jump into some of the other questions. You know, when you think about, you know, you talked about how you started and where you are, um, what was your vision for um, Tribus um, and the ultimate goal for the company? Well, uh, my vision all along is, was uh, in the area of technology. I, again, I have a very uh, technical background and and uh, to jump into a technology as a, a startup, I mean, as you know, these these technology pursuits are, are very risky. So uh, I had to go the consulting route. You know, there's a little bit more certainty, a little bit more stability. And uh, now that we are doing both uh, services and developing technology, I can go out and take a little bit more of a risk. Mm -hmm. But uh, back then it was more... Uh, just to be candid, it was more about just trying to survive and, and trying to, to learn the ways to continue to remain solvent. And again, I, I, I did not take any loans. I was trying to grow organically. And so it had to be a methodical process uh, to get to that point where, yeah, I have enough capital or en enough uh, retained earnings where I can uh, invest in R&D and eventually try to uh, productize or commercialize uh, products. But that's not to say that you know, I couldn't take on any additional funding now because what we have, if we desire to accelerate productization and commercialization, yeah, that, that would take a, a little bit more funding if, you know, depending on how, how fast we wanted to roll things out. So, yeah, if you look at the tagline on our presentation or on our website, it's, uh, it's impact through uh, technical innovation. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're really trying to have greater impact to the things that we develop in the area of, of wireless uh, AI and and even cybersecurity. And now all three of those fields are starting to be linked in one way or the other. You know, they're using AI and comms, they're using AI and cyber. Uh, cyber and wireless have uh, inex inextricably linked components as well. So. Well, the defense industry is a very, very large industry. Can you, uh, I know you probably, you and your team probably have all kinds of security clearances in order to do what you do, but can you share specifically the segment of the government area that you have areas of expertise? Well, again, it's, it's following your core competencies, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're right, some, uh, uh, some of these uh, organizations that you deal with require a, a certain security uh, clearance level for, for you to be able to work. But our, our portfolios, our core competencies are the area of, of wireless, AI, and cyber. And, you know, I guess our fourth, uh, our fourth competency is a professional service. So we are doing a lot of consulting work. Uh, a lot of folks that have 
uh, the technical backgrounds to serve in program or acquisition management and systems engineering to support uh, a lot of the consulting work that we have. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, DOD is probably the, the world's biggest customer with, with over uh, 500 million uh, uh, available dollars to the, to the department uh, every year. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's a huge market, but there's a lot of competitors as well. So I think trying to find that niche and really leveraging the skills that you have where you can outperform others that are competing against you. That, that's kind of the key to uh, success and, and putting together really good proposals. Well, great. Well, then I'm going to kind of try to take another slice at uh, looking at your area of expertise as far as you know, artificial, artificial intelligence. Are there specific challenges that you, that, that you and Travis um, address as far as the overall defense industry? Well, I, I think that that's key. I think it's it's carving out what you think you are the uh, that you can do better than most other folks. Mm -hmm. In the wireless space, we bring some very bright individuals that uh, used to work at Qualcomm. Uh, mm -hmm. Senior scientist was a uh, primary author of the IS95 standard, which of CDMA, which is uh, the first spread spectrum standard that uh, and really put Qualcomm on the map. I mean, he has a lot of talent, a lot of expertise, and we're doing a lot of cool things with both 4G and 5G today. So uh, leveraging that niche, and, and granted, there's a lot of other folks out there, but you know, uh, getting out and talking to the, the potential customers and telling them what you can do, that's, that's kind of the key to bringing in more business. Uh, within the uh, artificial intelligence front, uh, yeah, we have machine learning engineers that, that have good relationships with uh, folks in the um, the maritime industry, and we're, we're doing things in AI, uh, predictive analytics to support uh, users of the, uh, the inland waterways, mm -hmm. uh, developing a lot of tools to give uh, uh, the maritime industry a better user experience and uh, help them to better navigate or become more efficient in the logistics and the, the planning of the use of the, the waterways. Uh, we've developed uh, an app or a system that uh, mimics a lot of the the uh, GPS systems that are being used on the road. So uh, this is another great opportunity that we have for commercialization. Well, that's great. Um, and you, you mentioned that you started your business as a service-based you know, consulting business, and now you're a product, um, product and you know, tech-enabled service solutions. How did you make that transition? Like how, I mean, you mentioned that you started in 2010 and now you're, you know, approaching, uh, you know, 10 years old. Um, how did you make that transition uh, to to go from that service base to product base? Well, to be honest, we're we're still predominantly service base, and you know, it's it's my it's my priority to try to shift more of the service into a, a product or a solution base. So um, the the service based business has really kept the lights on. It, it's brought, brought in the revenue to help us do the uh, research and development for a lot of the, the technologies that we're developing. And until we get to that productization, commercialization, uh, we are also getting funded by organizations to continue development in mm -hmm. AI and wireless as well. So, um, so yeah, we're still uh, services based, but uh, again, things are starting to shift over. And, and uh, if it's my, uh, uh, if it's my choice, I, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer to go uh, all product, but uh, uh -huh. for now, we're going to continue to do both. Uh, both of them are, are revenue bearing, and I think the greater return on investment uh, eventually will, will come from the product side. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you can be able to take your product platform and make it an enterprise, you know, either subscription base that will, with some of the things you hope to uh, do with your company, you'll see that that could be a tremendous, um, a, a, a Tremendous way of scaling. And what's, what's great also is, you know, a lot of the development uh, that we're doing is getting paid for by the, the government. So we're kind of leveraging some of that to, to augment our R&D efforts as we develop new solutions. Yeah, if you can do that, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. Well, one of the other accomplishments was that um, Travis has been on the Inc. 5000 list for over six years. Uh, that's such a great achievement. So. Um, you know, as a service business, it's often very difficult to scale and grow. So 
how have you, what, if, what key, you know, one or two strategies have you utilized to keep growing year after year? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's doing it methodically. I mean, I, I think a lot of folks that start business want to grow so quickly. And, and again, we, we did this in a bootstrap manner. We didn't have any funding. Uh, we didn't have uh, venture capitalists kind of weeding down uh, our back saying, hey, uh, you need to grow so fast and bring in so much revenue. So we we're able to do it methodically, uh, develop the right partnerships, uh, seek out the opportunities where we thought we could add the best value and, and uh, without having to take on any loans, just continue to grow and, and give, give the uh, employees a good uh, work experience uh, not high stress and, you know, not have these, these targets that are, that are unrealistic, but have, you know, targets that, that uh, you could achieve. And so by, by doing that methodically and doing it uh, gradually, yeah, it just it kind of just worked out that we grew enough that we would qualify for the Inc. 5000, you know, uh, the last six years, including our first year of eligibility. So we were in business, you need to be in business at least three years and on our fourth year, that's the, the year that we actually uh, applied and, and got it. So so yeah, it's it's been great having a, a great uh, management team that, uh, that seek out the opportunities and, and put together proposals that are compelling, that uh, leverage our core competencies, our niches and we're looking to do the same with a lot of the technology opportunities uh, based on our technology portfolio as well. So that uh, that's going to be a growing endeavor over the, the next uh, year or two as well. Do you use any particular growth, um, I guess, methodologies or you know, annual play uh, 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 playbook or uh, consultants or any of those resources to help you with your your growth planning? No, I, what I do is I put out, uh, I put out goals for every year on mm -hmm. you know, how much we want to grow. And, and, and it's very specific, mm -hmm. uh, looking at specific areas of our portfolios, how much we want to grow our wireless, how much we want to grow our cyber, how much we want to grow professional services and, and put that out. And uh, everyone in the organization has the opportunity to submit the goals back on how they're going to support the, the corporate goals. And, and uh, you know, we, we've done well over the years. Uh, Travis has, uh, has given bonuses from day one. I've done profit, uh, profit share every year for the, for the last uh, eight years or so. And um, yeah, we, we've got matching 401k. So yeah, we, we do well in, in, in taking care of uh, our employees and, and compensating them uh, multiple ways. Again, through, through 401k, through profit share, and through bonus and referral fees. And it's, we've got the whole package kind of put in place. That's great. And um, you mentioned us from a financing standpoint that the primary method that you have funded and grow the company is through, you know, basically personal financing and, and retained earnings. Have you ever considered any other options, be it um, uh, outside funding or, or traditional debt? Yeah, I brought that up earlier, and uh, yeah, I mean, of course, the least risk is uh, if you know I fund it all myself. And again, if we're profitable every year, we have sufficient retained earnings to to do our own research and development, and to you know take care of employees and, and still have enough where you can uh, remain solvent. Uh, however, as you see with a lot of these startups in Silicon Valley or uh, companies with high tech. Uh, they, they seek funding so they can accelerate the productization and the deployment distribution of whatever products they have. And, and as you know, some companies, uh, they, you know, when they get kind of that kind of funding, they, they build up quickly and they exit quickly as well. They get bought by large companies. And so with some of our in innovations, I need to kind of decide, you know, do I want to stay methodical steady eddy and continue to grow and and uh, you know remain profitable or it, do we have a technology or a an innovation that might be positioned well like some of these uh, unicorns that could really uh, achieve a significant return on investment if I were to take some capital funding so 
I think, yeah, that that's still on the table, and that's that's uh, something that that I am still considering, and we'll probably use consultants to to better provide some guidance on that uh, mm -hmm. if I truly want to get something out there sooner than later. Well, if you had to do anything over with what you've done with Trevis, what might you consider doing when you think about now you're almost 10 years old, what might you, what might you do differently? Well, you know, I, I've, I, I've been blessed. I, I think again, we, we've grown every year. We don't have any debt. Um, we own the real estate. If, and I'm kind of thinking now, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this, uh, trying to accelerate technology or trying to scale operationally some of our, our innovations. Um, I'm starting to do that now. Maybe I'm thinking, hey, should I have started that uh, a year or two ago? Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, if I don't get this out there, somebody's going to take our patented idea and come up with a different solution uh, mm -hmm. that could be superior or exactly the same. So that's kind of what I am uh, anguishing over now is, you know, how much time or uh, capital do I want to put in these innovations? Because uh, I feel I'm, I might be trying to make up for some lost time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so many people don't realize how much time is so critical, you know, to speed to market. Yeah. Um, how does your firm work with or partner with small businesses to be either sub partners or, or resources to help you with solving the solutions for your customer? Well, I think, yeah, we, uh, we subcontract a lot to uh, folks. Uh, we're working with uh, some large businesses, developing uh, some wireless solutions for some of the big companies here in San Diego. Uh, we're working also with uh, commercial companies as a subcontractor, helping them with uh, wireless solutions. And then we also partner with uh, others that are subcontractors to us on some of the prime contracts that we have. So I think, uh, you know, working with companies uh, gains the synergy where, you know, the, the sum of the parts exceeds uh, each individual. What is it? The sum of the whole exceeds uh, individual capabilities. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when you can complement the other organizations that are trying to deliver a capability, then yeah, it, it, uh, it's a good relationship. But also, we just like working with companies that uh, that we mesh with well. You know, there's, there's great... Uh, companies with great leaders out there and uh, we like uh, these these great relationships and and the win-win scenarios is is always something that, uh, that that that's a result of a good partnership so yeah we are, we are always welcoming good partnerships where there's a win-win uh, scenario and given that you guys also in addition to the Inc um, 5000 you guys have won a number of SBA, uh, veteran owned business awards. Are you guys uh, sought out to mentor some other smaller SBA certified businesses as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure I qualify. We recently won an SBA award uh, that we were nominated for. Uh, I, I do not, uh, I, I do not actively uh, go out and, and, and seek uh, opportunities to, to get recognized. And maybe that's a fault on my part. And uh, I don't have the right PR person, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I'm always willing to, to help uh, anyone out that's, that's trying to get out there and, 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 and start a business. And, uh, but as you know, the statistics are, are, they're tough. You know, there's a lot of, well, you know, Kim, you've been doing this for a long time. And uh, uh, the batting average for uh, success in a small business that to make exits is a lot less than 50%. I mean, you, you know better what those percentages are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How has your business changed since COVID-19? I think we, uh, I think we're like a lot of other companies. I mean, COVID-19 is something that's forced people to work from home. And I'm sitting here in one of my bedrooms uh, talking to you. And, and uh, so uh, I had recently, I re recently purchased a, a building to expand our operations. Uh, and uh, we wanted to expand our wireless lab, our AI lab, and a signal processing lab. And, you know, when COVID hit, everyone's been working from home and a lot of folks haven't been coming in. Yet the productivity has remained, I think, relatively stable, if not better. You know, people are, are working long hours and I think COVID has kind of diminished the, 
the lines from when you start and when you quit work. A lot of people would just roll out of bed and, and start working and, and you can work and not realize when that the day's over. So uh, I, I think our productivities remain the same. I think some of the, uh, there, there have been less opportunities or some of the opportunities have, uh, have gone away with COVID, but we've continued to, to remain stable during this. And and uh, I, I've been going in every day, but uh, it's it's a pretty empty building. And I think people are, I mean, they're just as productive and and and, and happy being home safe. Yet, uh, you know, there's, we still had that same synergy through our, our Zoom meetings, our team meetings and, and WebExes that uh, all the other companies are enjoying as well. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, so um, one other question, a, a few other questions. You know, as a, a diverse military veteran owned business, you, you've heard the stats about, you know, the survival rate of small businesses we just talked about, and then even the, the more dire survival rate of diverse founder led businesses. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the major causes and what can be done to improve the situation for veteran led business survival or diverse founder led business survival? So uh, you know that, that's a that's a good question, and a lot of it uh, kind of depends on the business that you're going into. And uh, I mean, if you're going to go into a technology business or a consulting business, I mean, you certainly need to have the skills and intellectual capital to to support that endeavor. You know, if you're going into if you're going into a, a franchise type of business or another business that requires a lot of organizational and administrative skills, and you know, you need to have that and be better than a lot of your competitors and, and do the right analysis. So I, I think, uh, you know, getting to a level where uh, you are certainly an expert in your field is, is kind of the key to, to success. Uh, getting into a business where you may not have the skills um, or the core competencies to, to oversee that, it, it, it's, it's a very competitive environment out there. So yeah, if, if you can't be uh, at least better than the competition, then you're going to be struggling uh, quite a bit. So, and that's that's one of the reasons for uh, failure. Uh, folks are going in uh, into an endeavor where they may not have the skills to attract the investors or the skills to attract the the, the customers or the clients, and and so uh, making sure that you know that and that's why I think a side hustle is good. You can kind of gauge before you go all in to see uh, what your probability of success might be. So uh, certainly having the core competency to, to do well. Uh, and, then, and then after that, then there's all the other aspects of a business, the marketing, the handling of the money, the financing, the getting the sales folks, you know, the ability to talk and, and sell to a customer and get, get somebody to transfer money from their pocket into yours. Yes, that's, that's the ultimate. <laughs> That's the ultimate skill. And it, it takes a lot of different skills as you so, so articul well articulated that you need to have to make that happen. In fact, that's, um, really, and that's the only time you wear a tie is when you're trying to get them to transfer money from their pocket to yours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Exactly. Um, so if you were to meet the 21 year old Art Salon dog, what would you give, uh, what would you, what advice would you give him about uh, his future? Well, yeah, I think I think that the you know I I went to Annapolis and I think I was still growing up even at 21. So I I was fortunate enough that uh, at least I went to a military academy to give me a little bit of direction. And having served and and, and I'm, I'm very proud of my service. Yet yeah, it was a a growing up experience. It put me in an area of responsibility where I was managing the supervision of nuclear power plants and driving a nuclear submarine around at a, a very young age. So this, despite the stress, it was very, it, it helped me grow up quickly. It helped me uh, gain a sense of uh, responsibility along with the authority and accountability that, that goes with it. And uh, having done that for 20 years, I, I think, yeah, serving that kind of capacity, I, I, would, I would recommend anyone. But uh, getting into uh, what you enjoy, and in this case, it was technology, uh, is 
what I did as a nuclear submariner with advanced degrees and then working at Qualcomm, that those were areas where I had passion. And once you gain those kind of passions, I think you're in a position where, yeah, if you start a business, you, you are already ahead of your competition because you've worked in that field. And I think there's been recent studies now where uh, people are more likely to start businesses in their late 40s or 50s now mm-hmm. instead of in their 20s. Right. In their 20s, I, I mean, the folks that are starting in their 20s, first of all, I mean, a lot of these guys are, are brilliant between the Steve Jobs and the Mark Zuckerberg and Michael Dell and, and those kind of folks. And, and yeah, they're, they're finding a niche and, and doing really well. But for, for a lot of the other folks, yeah, they're starting later in life. Uh, they're gaining the uh, management, the technology experience and, and gaining that level of maturity. And also uh, what, what happens is you'll, you get to an age where your family becomes a little bit more stable. You can go out and take more risk. And, uh, you know, if, if you've got a family with kids and, and you're in your 30s and you think you want to start a family, and I have colleagues that are doing that with five or six kids, yeah, yeah that's, that's a tough risk. Now, you're, mm-hmm. now they're taking money from uh, friends, families, and uh, venture capitalists. And, and uh, what happens when the money runs out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, the business has got to go and, you know, all this, all this investment uh, is gone. So... Put yourself in a position where, where you can mitigate the risk. You know, when, when I started Travis, uh, my, my, you know, two of my daughters had already finished up college and I had just one left. I had a military retirement and I had very good, uh, I had a uh, very good uh, uh, funding that was a result of, you know, exercising stock options at Qualcomm. So uh, if you want to start a business, uh, do it methodically find ways to mitigate risk, take a look at your personal situation. Do you you have a family? Do you have kids? Are people relying on a a steady uh, income before you go out and start taking your nest egg and and putting it into a business that uh, uh, you're not certain is going to flourish? And then also making sure that you have the level of core confidence to, to be successful. And, and talk to mentors. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's a key thing is talk to people that have done it before and, and get their advice. Uh, and I, I have a, a bunch of consultants. I've got an executive coach. I've got, you know, like accountants, lawyers, and, and uh, other, other folks that have, uh, I go to, to, to help me out because yeah, I, I, I there's so much I don't know. And uh, it, it's better to get the, uh, the knowledge from folks that have done it. that can give you the, the best advice. Mm-hmm. So well, that, that's, yeah. that's- yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, and that, uh, so, you know, as a phenomenal leader that you are, how do you practice self-care and balance given, you know, running a growing company? That's, a, that's another good question. I, because yeah, it's, it's, it's so easy to, to work long hours, but I, I've made it a priority uh, for, for most of my life to, uh, to exercise. You know, I've, I think I've exercised at least uh, uh, three times a week and, you know, sometimes up to six times a week uh, for, for pretty, pretty much my, my uh, entire adult life. Uh, there may have been a, a stop when I was on submarines on these lengthy deployments, uh, but uh, for the most part, yeah, I, I enjoy it. It's kind of my stress reliever. And, and so whether it's, uh, whether it's biking or running or lifting or, or yoga or, you know, a variety of these things. I, I'm a kind of guy that likes to mix it up. I don't do one thing. I, I, I go do something different all the time. And, you know, after getting to that particular age where, uh, uh, again, for, for many decades, I was able to eat uh, whatever I want without uh, gaining weight. But uh, uh, the, the time when that metabol- metabolism slowed down, I, I finally started uh, watching what I ate and being a little bit more health conscious. So yeah, I've been much better at that and uh, trying to trying to avoid uh, things that uh, would raise your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and, and, and looking more at uh, uh, things better for my heart uh, mm-hmm. in a way. And yeah, you, you do that. Yeah, you can think better. You'll have uh, uh, greater longevity and you just feel better about yourself. So uh, I, and then also, uh, the, the social aspect uh, and being able to spend time with uh, friends and family and, 
your children and, and being able to unwind on the weekends as well. No, that's important. So what's, what are some of the things you do for fun? Well, I, yeah, I, I, um, I like going out to eat. Uh, uh, my girlfriend and I are foodies, so we're out all the time. Uh, we, we love to travel. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, uh, it, it's been a little bit uh, challenging to do. We are avid in uh, performing arts. You know, we've got the membership to the Old Globe, uh, Broadway, and uh, Symphony, and uh, the Playhouse. So we, we, we tend to, to do those uh, a lot as well. And uh, uh, again, and then we like to <laughs> like to watch sports as well. But uh, with with COVID, I think it's it's been a long walks and the and uh, getting out for for bike rides and and, and now I'm glad we can at least uh, go out and get something to eat. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's nice. So, um, what message would you like to share with our audience that we may not have covered? Well, if, if this is for if, if the audience are predominantly folks that are um, trying to start a business, uh, I, I think take a look at the methodical approach. Take a look at uh, your skill set and kind of figure out what do you do better than others that uh, you think that you can do well against your competitors and, uh, and, and you know, really do a true assessment before you, you make that leap. And if, if you're not there, then work for a while. Again, mm -hmm. if you're young, if you're in your 20s or 30s, there's still plenty to learn. And mm -hmm. you've got, uh, you know, another 20, 30 years to, or, you know, 10 or 20 years to kind of make up that knowledge and kind of figure out how people are doing it right and seek mentors. So I kind of repeated this, but uh, I, I think, yeah, don't, uh, and, and do something you like. I guess we didn't talk about that. You know, I told you I, uh, my, my focus was in technology. This is something I like. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of folks will probably try to jump into a business where they're trying to make the, the most amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do that and you don't like what you're doing, then it's not going to be as rewarding or enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, you, if you do something you like, it's going to be more enjoyable. But uh, there are industries that tend to pay more than others. I mean, in the fields of uh, uh, AI and biotech and wireless, I mean, those, those are areas where, yeah, there, there's a lot of government funding. There's a lot of opportunities. And then, you know, and if you go into restaurant kind of business, well, there's a, a lot of players and the margins just aren't that high. So that's another consideration, uh, depending mm -hmm. on, you know, what your priorities are. Yeah, the mm -hmm. enjoyment, the uh, margins, or uh, the quality of life that you want to have. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that, um, you know, if I were to, yeah, just to, to, you know, key takeaways for, our uh, audience that, you know, you shared about, you know, to be successful, you need to have skills and be able to have the ability to be competitive so that you can attract the research, attract the, you know, partners and customers and talent to help you. Uh, it's exciting to hear you being so passionate and you've built the area of expertise that you're able to make such a significant uh, contribution. And you've built a business that also you're able to compensate um, your team well, so you can attract the best and brightest talent of what you're doing. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, lastly, you built a, a great service-based business that's tech enabled and on the path to exploding with your commercial, uh, your commercialization of your technology in the, in the near future. Well, that's certainly the hope. And that was a very good summary, Tim. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Art, for joining us. Um, I wish you continued success. And um, I, I hope it's not going to be, you know, the, the dozens of years that it has been that we've had a chance to catch up. So, well, yeah, uh, I, saw you, I think I saw you at the club well, yeah. a year ago, right? We saw at, um, at, 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 uh, at a concert. So, oh, yeah, so yeah. The concert, I think I saw you at the club. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the university club. Yep. Right, so yeah. we'll have to definitely get a chance to, to, to uh, catch up soon. Yeah, okay. that would be great. Well, thank you again. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to share with you some of our upcoming uh, uh, sessions that we've got coming on. Just, uh, so we don't have that on in there. Um, uh, our next sessions that we've got coming on. Um, we're gonna invite you to register for our next webinar, which will be happening on the uh, 29th 
on at 10 a.m. Then it's got funded how diverse founders le leverage alternative option funding options to fuel their growth. And I invite you to visit us at um, foundersforcdc.org to register. And thanks everyone for attending and uh, good night. All right, thanks again. Thank you.